Um, Dr. Victoria, that was a very interesting talk. Um, you talked a lot about confounding variables. And uh, one question I have, uh, even in 1982, uh, to some extent, especially in an urban setting, breastfeeding is a luxury. You know, if, if the woman has to work or something like that, or if you have childcare issues. And also with the Jamaican study, um, you know, you mentioned the, the impact on the mother as well as the child. Um, to, uh, was there any assessment of the mother's well-being, or do you think even 30 years later, could you ask the mother what difference having uh, you know, an upper-class person come to their home and uh, interact with them, uh, what difference that had over and above perhaps the supplement and the, the toys? Um, and, and going forward, maybe looking at these social factors might be an important thing to be up, up over and above the epigenetic aspects. So maybe Dr. Victoria could answer that. Uh, we, our visits to our cohort, uh, I, I think part of your question applies more to the other speakers. Right. Our visit to our cohort, uh, we visited them at the first cohort, the 82 cohort. Uh, birth, uh, one year, two years, four years, and then uh, adolescent and adult. So we, we did not have very frequent visits uh, because we didn't have the money, basically. Uh, uh, and we did assess a little bit of maternal mental health, but very little. Uh, we did, we are doing that in the younger cohorts, but I still don't have any results to, to, to try to associate breastfeeding with maternal mental health. Uh, we did take a lot of of time worrying about confounding variables and, and making sure that we measured everything properly. Uh, I think, as I mentioned before, we were benefited by the fact that there was little social patterning or breastfeeding. And, and uh, the, the, the results I showed you on the LL score for, in, for schooling, they just became available a couple of weeks ago when we completed our GWAS in, a, in the whole cohort. Uh, that is reassuring because we thought, okay, if, they, the, if, if these kids have more intelligent mothers and fathers, who, and therefore they're breastfed for longer because of that, then this LL score, which is genetic, would be uh, higher in those who breastfed for longer, and if anything, it would slightly lower. So I think we're pretty, uh, I, I just wanted to take a very quick uh, stab here and say, it's really amazing how, how there's so much evidence on breastfeeding and intelligence, and it's still constantly being challenged. And uh, yeah, I'm sure there must be other forces that lead uh, to this intensity of challenge. And, and I'm, uh, it, it's very, uh, the, the study we did, and I think we got CNN and, uh, and New York Times and BBC because it was relating breastfeeding to money and saying if you're breastfed, you can make more money. And that was really putting, you know, the finger on it. Okay, well, thank you. I'm, so, I'm not well, sure I answered your question. Well, I'm, I'm not ch challenging breastfeeding. I'm just saying that I, yes. it's not just the milk, it's also the mother interaction. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, there's very limited, ev yeah, that's a good point. There's very limited, there's some evidence that if you're fed breast milk in a bottle, in a couple of trials that were done several years ago, you still become more intelligent. Right. But it's, uh, so there, there is something there too. There's definitely biological, uh, there are definitely biological mechanisms. I'm happy to discuss more about that, but I, I, for, for the sake of moving on the discussion, I'll let Susan. Okay, thanks. Um, in that original trial, we didn't look at mother's uh, mental health. But we, 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 so in that trial, we looked at her caregiving practices. So we, we could see an improvement in the quality of the home environment, the quality of caregiving. In a later trial, we, have, we did look at mental health and we found reduced depressive symptoms in the mothers who were visited. And I, I should point out, the visitor is not an upper class person. The, the visitor is a community health worker. And in that trial, often somebody from their community who just who is trained to be a health worker um, and is employed by the government as that. So, and I think that's actually an important part of why there may be benefits because what they, we, while the visit doesn't do doesn't have it contain things specifically focused on mental health, it's the approach to the visit and having an empathic person come and listen to you and value the things you say. 
um, may have been the, the mechanism. And one of the things we want to do going forward is to try and strengthen those aspects of the intervention. It's a question on the left, please. Yes. Two questions. The first one is, is a follow up to that because the the changing the mother com, uh, comments actually strike a quite a chord for me. And in the sense that is in within the study, um, if if the primary caregiver is not directly the mother, um, does that make a difference um, in those interactions? And the follow and the second question relates to um, the immune system. Uh, because uh, that's uh, this related to the other talk. Sorry, they're unrelated uh, questions. Um, because one of the things that with, for many of the developing uh, for the for many of the uh, lower middle income countries um, where the child mortality is really high, some of the major causes of death are still within the communicable causes, and there hasn't been quite a transition yet. And um, so in that case, when you're looking at the epigenetic pathways or, or pathways where, where nutrition intersects with these um, responses uh, to communicable causes, it's not certainly, it's, it's not really a plus or minus response or, or the volume of the response, like how strong, not everybody who is infected with malaria dies or um, some of them, some even within the same socioeconomic status, it's not. Um, not all of them will even yet yeah, will, will not always have the same kind of response. So, is do you f feel that the nutrition field, uh, the intersection between nutrition and epigenetics, would also have um, um, is, is going towards more specificity to actual causes and uh, that are affecting more aware uh, that are more specific than just general inflammation or general immune responses um, and, uh, for your uh, for your class. Those are the two questions. Sorry, completely unrelated question. <laughs> I'll, I'll do a very quick answer. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, it's often the, the primary caregiver typically has, is, has been the mother in our setting, but often is not. So and we would work with whoever happens to be the child's primary caregiver. Sometimes it's an aunt, an older sister, uh, the father. Um, we haven't had the numbers to really look at that to see whether who the person is makes a difference. I think it's important that the per the, the adult who's inter the con child's consistent adult caregiver is the person who changes. Yeah, so um, I think you're bringing up some really interesting points as it relates to the intersection of nutrition, epigenetics, and potential mediation um, in the immune system. Um, I didn't want to give the impression in my talk that epigenetics is a black or white thing. In fact, it's very much not. Um, it's a, it tends to be a very creative thing. Um, but to I think um, to more directly address your question, we actually just uh, happened to publish a paper uh, in PNES a few months ago on the CBU cohort uh, that Dr. Victoria um, talked about as part of the cohorts uh, study. And uh, again, focusing on the immune system, what we, what we reported in that paper is that there are in fact um, a multitude of uh, different um, early life exposures, microbial, um, nutrition, um, that all um, shape at, on the one hand, the epigenome, and this was focused on immune um, genes, uh, DNA methylation, so demo switches, and on the other hand, um, are associated with things like CLP, um, so C-reactive protein, uh, and, and, and the like, in adults. Um, and so, so I think what we didn't find is that they're actually interacted. Um, so they seem to have been, at least at, on this study and this level of granularity, uh, seem to have um, different, um, I guess, epigenetic um, linkages with some of these exposures affecting particular epigenetic marks and other epigenetic marks in turn being affected with uh, outcomes. There's a question, two questions on the right. Perhaps we'll start with you and then behind you. Outside of the 20th and 21st century uh, patterns uh, that help follow uh, uh, going to decades previous, whether it's you know, between 16th and 17th, 
conventional sort of uh, schemes that are put forth in the different socioeconomic environments in which infants uh, uh, are raised. So has, has, have your uh, research components included uh, historical non-tracking uh, methodologies that were, uh, I guess, if you want to call it best practice or you know, uh, the accepted norm um, of uh, you know, cent centuries previous? Um, and, uh, In what parts of the world, if that is the case, <laughs> Uh, did you ben benchmark any of perhaps the research or um, some of the work that you've done in the past? So I guess it's open to anyone that uh, may have uh, realized that. Um, thank you very much for your question. I can try to take an, uh, a response and then see if the panel members have, um, have, have things to add. Um, so I'm responding related to early child development and our uh, thoughts on and practices on early child development have varied tremendously over the centuries and even within the um, 20th and 21st century. So that there have been times when children were seen and not heard and times where um, it's been uh, spare the rod and spoil the child. They have varied tremendously. So there, the, you know, there's an ongoing learning looking at um, practices that have been in the, in the past in our attempts to understand the theories of uh, early child development. What that has um, really pushed us to do is to look at cultural differences so that we have then attempted to look at how children are raised um, throughout the world in very, very different cultures. Uh, as an example, when I mentioned the uh, three series in The Lancet that looked at early child development, they on purpose looked at um, what the evidence that we had from low and middle income countries. When Dr. Victoria showed his first slide of what the world looks like in terms of um, breastfeeding or that would be the, uh, childhood, as opposed to where the research is done, we realize the research has been done in countries other than where the children are. So in, in response to your question, what the current theories have tried to do is to look more broadly across uh, the cultures rather than being uh, North America centric. Please. Oh, no, the, 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 whole, the point of the interaction is to include the parent. So the parent is not there or, or not willing to take part, not able to take part because they're busy doing something. You, the, the, the session can't take place. It could not take place without the parent. See the Dr. Dirks or the person sitting beside him? First of all, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Vittara. I'm very pleased to use this year's recipient. Very well chosen and excellent presentation. I have followed for many years the Barker's hypothesis. And actually, one of my regrets many years ago when I came up with the Gerber's, the evidence wasn't conclusive enough. It was hard a little bit to relate things perfectly or even imperfectly to birth weight. But uh, being a nephrologist, also, when it comes up with the data that shows uh, that uh, whatever index you want to use of premature development, it affects, for example, the number of nephrons. And the number of nephrons, if they're lower, is more likely going to lead to hypertension and the long-term cardiovascular disease. So I'm sort of looking for an integrative hypothesis here, and maybe you'd like to uh, enlarge on that. Uh, one thing I, I, I have learned uh, is that you cannot you should really not look at a single outcome and relate that to early growth. Because early growth and early size and low birth weight, they affect so many different systems uh, of the body in different ways. And 
Mm, if you look at a single outcome, you may get the wrong answer. That's why multi-purpose cohorts with multiple outcomes, including intelligence and including mental health, and not only the cardiovascular markers is so important. And my best example is high blood pressure. Uh, tall people need higher blood pressure to reach their brains, right? Other things being equal. Uh, a lot of research, uh, mainly from the developed countries, they come up and say, oh, uh, higher birth weights are related with uh, higher blood pressure, higher weight or height at one year or two years. And then you get a, a, a headline saying, oh, uh, you know, putting on weight early is bad for your blood pressure. Well, you do need a higher blood pressure if you end up being taller. Uh, but you also become more intelligent and, and you have less diabetes and, and so on. So uh, I think, uh, you know, Barker was absolutely fantastic. I mean, he was a visionary and, and we epidemiologists, he was an epidemiologist, but he was discredited uh, by the best epidemiologists in the UK because he said, oh, this is all confounding. This is all social, you know. Social somehow, you know, it doesn't count. <laughs> you know, this is all socially influenced. But he was proven right. I mean, and there are trials now, and they have been, they have been replicated so widely. And so if, if I think we need some kind of a integrative thinking about it is looking at the whole picture. Don't get the single outcome and say, this is good or this is bad because of the single outcome. Right at the back. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question for Dr. Kober around um, mental health and epigenetics. And I was wondering if there has been any work looking at collective trauma and its role, um, specifically thinking in light of Canada and the indigenous community and the truth and reconciliation work that's being done. So if there's any types of studies that have investigated collective trauma and epigenetic effects. Uh, excellent question and certainly something that we are very interested in. To my knowledge, this particular topic has not been um, addressed. Um, you know, before Glide passed away, we had many discussions about intergenerational trauma relating to residential schools uh, and the like. We actually have um, um, a memorandum of understanding with several First Nations in uh, British Columbia to um, work with them to, to address this. Uh, in fact, um, we have a grant in <laughs> for it. Um, it's, it's the obvious question where, you know, if epigenetics really is at the nexus of these um, traumatic events and, and outcomes, broadly speaking, this would be the place to look. So stay tuned. <laughs> we have a question in the second row. Yes, I think this is for Dr. Walker, if I remember correctly. There's so many talks, I can't keep them completely straight. Um, you did a sequence of IQ tests, I believe, and each instrument was different. Um, I assume that's because if you repeat the instrument, there's sort of a learning and, and the validity is lower. Is, is that why you did it? That, that's a, a preliminary question. Um, then you're... There's a lot of controversy about IQ tests. And when I saw the, the differences you mentioned, I thought they were in IQ points and they looked minuscule, but maybe they were in standard deviations. Were they significant? In okay. Oh, wait, it, which difference? In the, on the figure? Yeah. Okay, that same figure with the different tests. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the tests changed primarily because the children got older. Mm -hmm. So the first two were developmental quotients, so developmental tests. And then the, this, then we did this, we changed with the test from the seven to the 11 year follow up, simply because we thought that the 11 year test was a better test and gave us more, it gave us verbal IQ and performance IQ as well, rather than one global global figure. And then the, the final changes were, again, as the children got older, they moved from a ch childhood test to an adult IQ test. So the test changed because of those reasons, not for any other reasons. Um, the, the, on the figure, we showed standard deviations because, because the tests were changing. We, we changed the, the um, we, cha we, div we calculated standard scores for each of the tests. 
So I think actually that, um, there's one final question. Thank you. Uh, this is a question about state's definition for stunting in those studies, like uh, the, the workers. When you base your case definition on a certain period of time, like uh, two years, you decide that this child is stunted based on blood measurement minus two C scores, for example, and then they go this for the rest of uh, his life. Uh, how do you control for the effect of genetics? Because we know that the pattern of gaining weight and height might be the same for children uh, uh, and especially one of your outcomes when you said uh, children of stunted children were also stunted uh, uh, probably a more plausible interpretation could be that uh, the, the pattern of uh, gaining height uh, is uh, predetermined is genetic rather than I mean from the father to the child rather than than the, from the child. Uh, uh, I mean, the, it's a genetically predisposed to short, maybe not short stature, but a pattern of height gain that is not uh, exactly <coughs> as the other children. Um, so the, the question is that how you control for the effect of genetics in patterns of height gain when you base your case definition on uh, one measurement mm -hmm. at age two, for example. Yeah. Um, I don't think we can completely, completely exclude that for some of the children there may be, genet genetics may be involved, but really for the definition of stunting and um, below minus two standard deviations of height for age, in a poor community, the vast majority of children who you identify will not be short because of genetics. It's, they will be short because of environmental things, some of the things that um, Kay spoke about in terms of nutrition and in infections. So we're, to some extent we're making, we're, we're interpreting the stunting to primarily reflect chronic undernutrition and exposure to infections because of the fact that they're from very poor circumstances. We cannot completely rule out that for some of the children, genetics may be involved. I don't know if anybody else wants to come on. Do you have time? Or? Yeah. I could speak on this for half an hour. <laughs> I have a passion. Uh, yeah. In a, in a, the thing is, Kay and I were part of the WHO multi-center uh, growth curve study. She, she was PI in the Davis side, and I was PI in Pelotas. And up to the age of five years, if you take high socioeconomic status children uh, who are healthy, who are born at term, and who are, uh, have uh, good environmental conditions and so on, the, 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 there's remarkable similarity of growth uh, across different continents and different countries. Um, I just wanted to give an example. We did that in this study. We selected kids from uh, well-off families with optimal environments and nutrition. Uh, at two years of age, the, the kids from the Brazilian site uh, were about two centimeters, which is a small difference, uh, taller than the kids from Norway. Can you believe that? If you look at me and if you look at a Norwegian person, you think that <laughs> this must be wrong. It's not wrong. Up to in the first years of life, if you have a good environment, the, the genetic Right now, we think that genetics accounts for 10 to 20 percent of adult height uh, overall, uh, and the rest is really environmental, nutritional, and due to other infections and other exposures. So, okay, no. sure. So, <laughs> um, I think this is also very important for all things epigenetics to account for genetics. Um, we didn't have time to talk about this, but there are a number of studies, including really amazing, uh, beautiful work by Elizabeth Bindel. Um, uh, as it relates to post-traumatic stress disorder, um, but also um, suggesting that there is a very strong correlation, uh, not only um, in terms of susceptibility and uh, outcomes but, um, f for allelic variants, but also that's actually in part um, synergizing with epigenetic variation. And, and we in various cohorts are finding the same, that a lot of the epigenetic variation is really a result um, of genetic and environment interacting. <laughs>